sentences. And I normally don't do that. Very rarely do I do more than one arena. But I'm going to go to John 16. And then I'm going to go to Matthew 7, 7, Hebrews 13 and 8, Matthew 24, verse 35. And uh, I know you're standing, but uh, just these scriptures, in a sense, would be a message in their own. Uh, All I know is the theme I want to cover. All I know is what I'm feeling in my heart and in my soul. And I want to deliver that to us tonight. John 16, one verse, verse number 23 John 16, verse number 23. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give give it you. My, 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 my. But we do have to ask in Jesus' name. But verily, verily, truly, truly, what we ask, he will give it. Are there other qualifications in the word of the Lord? There are some, asking according to the will of God. But there are some things we know are absolutely his will. It's his will to save mightily. Then in Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Then in Hebrews 13... Verse number 8, Jesus Christ, Acts thir- excuse me, Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Our God is the same as when he said it. He's the same today. He has not changed. He'll be that way tomorrow. And then, Matthew 24, verse 35. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, it's talking about prayer, the veracity of God's faithfulness to our faithful prayer. We're dealing with a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the earth you're standing on will pass away, but this word will never pass away. Let's pray, let's pray tonight that God would indeed talk to us And draw us after him. Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight. You are utterly, absolutely, wondrously, gloriously, beautifully gracious. We thank you, Lord, for being our friend, our God, our Savior, our King. Anoint us in Jesus' name. Anoint us to do your work mightily in the name of Jesus. We commit this service into your hands. And everyone said amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. You may be seated. The beautiful name of the Lord. As I stated, our text alone for the thoughtful person is a message in itself. They are dealing with the subject of God's faithfulness, his unchanging 
nature. The heaven will pass away. The earth will pass away. Literally, there'll be a new entire set of heaven and earth. But the words that we've read to you in the host of that scripture from which we've read, it'll never, ever, ever pass away. Among the things that will never, ever pass away is the fact that Jesus let us know that if we would be a people that would talk to him, that would ask him, that would seek him, that if we would continue to do so, if we would ask, what we've asked for would be given, what we seek for we will find, and the doors we are knocking on will be opened unto us. Because all the true askers will be receivers, the seekers will be finders, And those that knock will have the door or doors opened to them. And this is coming from a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said in Malachi, I am the Lord and I change not. Amen. James 1.17, in him is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. He is exactly today what he was and will ever, ever be. Therefore, as Simon Peter said, beloved, having these precious promises, these are utterly, absolutely, totally, wondrously precious promises. And promises that are meant to be acted upon. A promise that is not acted upon is null and void. The Bible says, repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And what do you get? Remission of sins. And you will also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, how many have had that promise fulfilled? Raise your hand. If the, if the new birth worked for you, the same promise that if you repent and be baptized that you receive the Holy Ghost is also that when we seek him, that he will answer us. I talked about Wednesday, one night, the fact that Moses himself expected quicker results and fewer problems. So understand that there may be durational times. And, and whereas Moses in his frustration said, God, I don't even know why you called me. Ever since you called me, I, I haven't seen what you told me. So even Moses, as successful as he was, as again, as we taught Wednesday night, He struggled. He thought he'd see faster results and fewer problems. Okay, Jesus did say, the same God tells us that in the world we would have tribulations. He let us know that in the process of asking, that he that asketh, and that is in a continuing Greek tense word, asketh, that means asks and keeps on asking. Knocks and keeps on knocking. Seeks and keeps on seeking, shall find. It is a process. And faith has to be in a state of continuum. It's, it's, it's we will continue to believe until we receive. Uh, I made mention of the little boy screaming for the cookie, and when mom finally got around to giving him the cookie, he was gone. And that often that's the way it works with us. I did not make mention, though I have in the past, of the pastor I read about that his office was down the hall from the secretary and other members of the staff. And one day they heard a bam and they heard a boom and and they heard things apparently being thrown and crashing sounds coming from his office and 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 everybody's in the hall and 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 the assistant said, Is who 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 who's in there? And just him. He ain't with nobody. No, no. And, and every now and then there'd be a yell and, and a bam and a boom. And, a, and they're thinking, oh my goodness, what's happening? And when he finally came out and he was rather disheveled and very frustrated. And, and, and they, they said, uh, Pastor, what's, uh, what's the problem? What's wrong? He said, the problem is I am in a hurry and God isn't. And when I read that, I thought, oh, 
I, I have empathy for you. Empathy for you. But God is still the same. And you got to hang in there. And he is so faithful. So there are people that have had this Acts 2.38 blessing stolen from them. They did not repent for whatever reason. Somebody or something talked them out of repenting, of truly turning their heart towards God and away from their world of sin, wherever it was. And something has talked them out of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And something has allayed them, delayed them, swerved them aside from receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But when the earth passes away and the heavens are no more to be replaced by new ones, this promises those will still be there. They were the losers. God was true. Let every man be a liar. God's word is true. So we've seen that. We're aware of that. We see the tragedy of that. But at the same time, we cannot allow anything to rob us and to cheat us from our promises of what God will do. And there's a lot of thieves out there. I have been making mention lately in and everything from the minister's class in here to individuals, etc., that that in the world we're living in, and I believe, I personally do believe that this is a truism that's been true since man. But now, in this 21st century, it is unbelievably, exceptionally, excruciatingly true. If you are going to be a man or woman, or a young man or young lady, or a boy or a girl of prayer, you have to take the proverbial machete because you're in a jungle. You're in a tangled jungle of vines and a clutter of leaves that are, that are interposed across, around, behind, before the path of life. And if you're going to get through that, you've got to take the machete. And I've never done this, but I've read many accounts of this where people have to literally chop their way through the jungle to get where they and their goods behind them and the people with them wanted to go. They had to chop their way through. Can I tell you that if you are going to pray, you got to get you the proverbial machete and you got to start hacking your way through all of the vines and all of the reasons and all of the allayments and delayments, amen, delays and, and excuses and everything else and the to-dos and the have-to-dos and the must-dos and should-have-dones and, and everything else that crowds our time. If you're going to pray, you've got to hack out a spot and make it happen. And there's 10,001 excuses for not praying any given time of day that you choose to pray. I mean, it can be, I'm just too busy or, uh, you know, I'm too sleepy <coughs> or I just can't focus. I can't concentrate and there's just too many distractions and, and I, well, I just, I just, I, I forgot. It's too hard to do it. And I'm not sure if it's all that good because I don't get much results and, and, um, I can't find a place to pray and, you know, sometimes I pray my mouth gets dry and, and if I'm on my knees, my knees hurt and I don't, I want to pray, but I can't wake up in time and I don't even got time for my family, let alone time for prayer and I'm taking classes and I'm under, you know, I just got too much pressure and it doesn't seem to do all that much good, you know, and I seem, sometimes I pray and things get worse and I don't think my prayers really, really matter and who cares and nobody appreciates it. And my mind goes blank and I get too nervous to pray and you know, it's too boring to pray and you know, I'm just not the prayer type. I'm just not the prayer type. And, let, you know, others can pray, and they, they seem to do it better. And, and I can't find anything to pray about. Duh. How horrible, that one. Did you ever hear of your family? Did you ever hear of your parents? Did you ever hear of your kids? Your wife, your husband? Did you ever hear about your church? What about your brothers or your sisters? What about this nation? What about coworkers? What about loved ones? What about you? 
What about you? There's plenty of things to pray about. What about your neighbors? What about your fellow students? What about the kingdom? What about the lost? What about this pitiful nation? How long a list you want to have about things that need to be prayed about? Amen. And, uh, and so, so don't say there's nothing to pray about. And, and then, but then if you're not, you say, well, it's just, you know, prayer is just too private to even discuss. And, and, and I'm under attack of the devil, and I don't think I should be praying. And I'm too confused to pray. And uh, why would God want to hear me? And, and um, you know, I just don't know if that I can, I can keep up with it. So why even get started? And then I get condemned. Condemnation bums me out. And, and uh, I don't really know enough about prayer to, to get after it. And, and, uh, and I don't know that I ever want to bad enough. And I think when I pray at church, that's probably enough. And um, you don't understand, I would pray, but I've misplaced my teddy bear. And man, if I can't find my teddy bear, how in the world? How do you expect me to pray, amen, and uh, when you consider who got elected last or is going to get elected next time or, or, or that my vote counts or it don't count or whatever. Uh, you know, I mean, what's there? Come on, give me a break. Hallelujah. My kids are too mean for me to pray. My mother-in-law is too mean. My father-in-law is too mean. My mother's too mean. My wife's too mean. My husband's too mean. I'm too mean. My boss is too mean. I'm going to tell you, brother, you got to hack your way through all of the excuses and thieves that will come on you. Amen. If you if you want to if you want to know how powerful those those thieves are, when I'm when I misplace a to do list, okay, here is my present to do list. You probably can't see it from there. All right, I, that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 things that I got to get done by Wednesday. And, um, and there's uh, other stuff. And that's, uh, that's not, doesn't include the stuff I got in my phone. And if I lose this list, I'm in bad shape. But I can tell you how I can bring it back to me. If I lose the list and I come to pray, it all starts coming back. When you're praying, you start thinking all the things you've got to do. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll get a piece of paper and a pen, and when I think of it, I'll just write it down and keep on praying. And just keep on praying. And then, and then call it your flesh or the devil or whatever. Remind you something else you've got to be doing. You write it down and you keep on praying. Amen. There's just something about it. Did you, if you stop and think about this, brothers and sisters, just think with me. He says, is, is it, are you going to be preaching tonight or what are you doing? I'm doing whatever I'm doing. Amen. If prayer, if nothing else, all of the things that fight us to prayer ought to let you know how important it is. Just that fact alone ought to let you know how important prayer is when you consider all the things you got to fight your way through internally and externally just to make it happen that ought to let us know how important prayer really really is and prayer is powerful i'm 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 here to tell you that sometimes think well i'm not good enough to pray well uh you know I don't pretend to understand all of that and how that it works. I preached here a while back that God is not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of attitudes. And, and before I came to God, when I was a sinner, 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 sinner. Now, Paul, the apostle Paul stated, he said, he came, this is a saying worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came to save, save sinners, of whom I am chief. I am, not was. Okay? I can relate to Paul. But I remember prior to my new birth experience, when Jesus changed me and saved me, being on probation from the time I was 14 until I was 21. And the problems, traumas, trials. Amen. Of going from one arrest to the next arrest. One vast problem to the next. And 
sinner that I was, and though I was, I would pray when I got in a jam and I got in trouble. The worst time I ever got in a fix before I came to God was, uh, was a drug bust. And it hit the 10 o'clock evening news and we got, a, we got arrested at 8.30 at night. And by 10 o'clock it was on the news throughout southern Colorado. And my parents didn't even, they didn't have any idea where I was. And my mother got a phone call from and her sister living in another city far away that said, well, so Larry's in jail. That was wonderful. And, but in that time when I was in jail and I had a copious amount of um, heroin on my person while I was in jail jail. I had been frisked at the rest scene. I had been gone through thoroughly in the jail and they still didn't find it. But that time when I got arrested, I remember leaning handcuffed over the back of the car and, and police had already been screaming. I'd already been, I shoved the cop to the ground and I took off running, and I was throwing drugs as I was running, and ran to some backyard in Pueblo, Colorado. I ran into a chicken wire fence. Who raises chickens in Pueblo? But there was my lot in life. And I got rid of all of it but the Kodak can full of uncut heroin. And while I'm on the back of the car, handcuffed, I can feel it. And I know, and I've already been on probation and stuff since I was 14 I'm toast look out prison here I come and while I laid there with screaming policemen all around me and lights flashing everywhere I said God I'm not even going to pray I'm not going to ask you to help me because I've asked you so many times to help me and you've got me out of so many fixes I'm not even going to waste your time with another set of promises that I'll just break later down the road and that time he helped me like whoa dude and, and I'm not going to belabor it but when I was finally and I said, I need, and when I got into a restroom and I got up close to the wall away from the camera and I'm unscrewing the lid and I'm spreading the heroin all over the floor and I'm doing the two-step and grinding it away with my feet. And then I'm, I'm putting it under my foot and I'm crunching it down flat. And then I make my way to the restroom and I, and I, and I throw it in the stool and I flush the stool and it comes back up. And there's, and uh, and so I flush it again, and it comes back up. And so I put it back on my person. And when they put me up on the third floor, and I already had a buddy that had escaped from the third floor about two months before, and uh, and uh, he jumped out a window of the restroom. But when Rocky escaped, they fixed it where nobody else could escape, and. Uh, so I went up to the third floor and I flushed it down and it was gone. And in that time, and even at that, with, with, with the marijuana they had found and the LSD they had found, I was still going to end up in prison. They found enough on me over an ounce of marijuana. It was still, still going to be a felony. I was still toast, even without heroin. And, and God had mercy. And I won't bore you, but the DA was running for re-election and he needed some more convictions. And so he, made, he, he had me two guys for felony, but if the other guys would cop to a misdemeanor, he'd dish out four misdemeanors. We'd all get misdemeanors instead of us two getting felonies. We wouldn't go to jail, but everybody would be record and he could have more convictions and he'd get re-elected. And he was. And also I had a, 
I had a lawyer that he went on to become, and he was a, he was a, he was a defense attorney. That, uh, what do you call it? Will they give it to you free? Public defender. Now, most of the time, they're horrible. But this guy, he turned out to be the most powerful defense attorney in the city of Denver. He moved to Denver and he made millions. I don't even know if he's still alive, but, but he was a force to be reckoned with. But he hated the narcotics division of the Pueblo police. And so he rolled up his sleeves and he went to work. And then, in my stupidity, when he got us off in the courtroom, and, he, and the DA didn't even, I'm getting sidetracked, but the DA didn't even tell the police the deal he had cut. And when they did it, and the police officers, the narc officers, one of which my cousin tried to kill, but he missed him, uh, literally, and, and, and they were throwing stuff on the table, they were cussing in the courtroom, they were screaming, they were so angry, and I was so stupid, me and my buddy looked at him and grinned. Oh, oh God. I deserved a bullet in my forehead. But God had mercy on me, not because of what I was, but he knew what he was doing when nobody else knew what they were doing. And then, and then later, later, it was, in a sense, it was a few months. It was, it was, it was, it was around 11, 12 months later. And I have repented. I don't know about baptism in Jesus' name. I'm reading in the book of Acts, but, but I have repented and I've quit my drinking and I've quit my drugging and I've quit my smoking and, and, and I didn't have a pastor. I didn't, I didn't have anybody looking over my shoulder. I quit, I quit watching TV. God convicted me severely of, of watching television. I wouldn't watch television. I would, I would read my Bible at night. And, and my old friend, the other guy that had the felony, that it ended up being a misdemeanor, and, and he, they, went, he sent, they sent him back to Vietnam. And In fact, that's where we were getting the heroin from. He was sending it from Vietnam. And... And, 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 and he was so, he was so messed up and he had his, he had his 72 Barracuda with a 383 board and stroked and was a screaming machine with the, with the, with the, um, um, eight track CD player deck that in the music light system that would light up the inside of the car with all kinds of different colors. This is back in 72, according to the beat and whatever instrument was being played at the present time. And, 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 and here was my buddy and he was strung out and he was messed up and, and I didn't know anything, but, but I would pray and pray. And I said, God, and I would try to talk to Joe and he wouldn't listen. And I prayed and I said, God, you got to talk to Joe. You got to. And I said, God, you got to shake Joe Till his teeth rattle. And I'm going to tell you something. There are some folks we better get to praying for. And I mean down to business and say, God, I want you to shake them till their teeth rattle. And get down to business. That's my, I'm going to tell you something, folks. God. I'm going to come back to this. Don't let me forget Joe. Last week, I'm going to tell you where this message got started on me. Last week, we were here and we were praying for some people. And I know it and you know it. But it hit me with a ton of bricks. I was praying for some. I can't even remember who. But it hit me so bad. The generation we're in and the people we're working with and the people we were and are and that if we ever needed the delivering power of God, it's right now. And when people come, they need their minds delivered. They need their souls delivered. They need their spirits delivered. They need their bodies delivered. They need healing for their body, healing for their minds, healing for their souls, healing for their spirits. They need need God so bad. They need deliverance. 
And I'm going to tell you something, our little two steps and patty cakes ain't going to get it. And it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It isn't a new thing. It isn't something I haven't known before, but, 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 but it's just gripped me. Church, church, church. I'm going to tell you, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more we've got to have God, almighty God. Coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down in prayer meetings, coming down in song, coming down when we're worshiping, coming down during the preaching of the word of the Lord, coming down in the altar services, coming down in baptism. We've got to have God. And I just don't know of, there's many avenues and we know there's a, there's a, there's a host of things That we do and we express and we love and we go and we grow and we go forward with God. But if prayer is one of the main things, why are we so fought? We've got to pray. And there's a lot more Joes out there. And and I said, God, you shake him till his teeth rattles. And, and, And I prayed that. And it was on me the next day. I didn't have the Holy Ghost. But the Spirit of the Lord, God was moving on me and dealing with me. And and I prayed again. I didn't know about intercession. And I didn't know about travail. I didn't know about any of those things. I didn't know that the effectual, fervent prayer was something. But I knew that I was, and I didn't even know the terms. I knew that I was fervently praying. Had no idea if it was effectual. But I knew I was into it. And it was God. You gotta shake Joe to his teeth rattle. And I'd go to college and and then I'd come home and I'd begin my prayer and I'd get back to Joe and it'd be even stronger. After three days of that, out on Highway 50. No, Highway 96, going up to Beulah. And a friend of mine. Teo that lived out there. His father was a doctor. And a lot of times they would start a drag race from there. The highways were not near as busy as now, especially Highway 96. Just a two-lane road. And Joe and his barracuda, there I was praying, God, shake him till his teeth rattles. And he was, he was, he was, they were going to, he was going to drag race a guy. Pretty high stakes. So he told Ed Montoya to get out of the car. I don't want no excess weight. And they started racing. The smoke from the tires, the, the screaming machine. And, and Joe was just a little bit off his game because he was a little too stoned. And when he's going all the way, and he's watching neck and neck. I don't even know what kind of car he was racing. But he, the last time he looked at his he knew it was over 100 miles. I think it was 110 miles an hour, if my memory serves me right. And he was still gaining momentum. And a Volkswagen, he looks up and there's a Volkswagen right in front of him. That's obviously not going 110 miles an hour. So he cranks, he hits a guardrail, it shoots him straight up into the air. He's going so fast. He goes to the top, the car hits the top of a telephone pole where there's a power pack every so many miles, transformer. It explodes. It knocks out the electricity on the south side of Pueblo from Prairie Avenue all the way out to my house. And it explodes, and he comes down. There was an embankment at that time. They've since filled it in, but he rolled two times, end over end. The only thing salvaged out of that 72 Barracuda, the only thing salvaged was his car stereo radio and the bucket seat he was sitting in. That's the only thing. Everything else was gone. And Joe didn't get one broken bone. And God shook him till his teeth rattled. But when I talked to him about it, he said, his father died a few years ago and was keeping his hand on him. And he didn't have time for God. But God did answer my prayer. He was later killed in a motorcycle accident. But God still answered my prayer. 
There's something about the power of prayer. There's something about the power of prayer. And, and, and the things that God can do. I remember, and there's just uh, some of these you've heard, but I'll never forget, Joel and Michael, you remember Sister Heather. I've talked about her. God bless her, but she had a tumor in the middle of her brain. It grew to be about the size, a little bit bigger than a ping pong ball. And the doctors, and it was a cancerous tumor. And the doctor said, it's totally inoperable. We cannot touch it. If you touch it and you even slightly touch even the slightest, she'll be nothing but a vegetable the rest of her life. And so it was, it was, it was an impossible situation. But we prayed and we fasted and the church prayed and the church fasted. And then the reports began to come back and the doctors were dumbfounded because that tumor began shrinking, shrinking, shrinking until it went all away. I'm not about the power of prayer. I'm talking about a God who's so big and so mighty. I remember when I, when I was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and, 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 and I was working a job and, and, and I was not used to working before I came to God. And, uh, and I had a boss that was, uh, bless his heart, he was kind of a demon. <laughs> but anyway, and so he had me carrying two, two sheets of 12-foot sheetrock at a time in by myself. And I was so tall that to get him through a doorway, I would have to bend down in order to carry the two pieces of 12-foot sheetrock. So I'm bending down. My knees are bending. My back is bending so I can get them underneath the doorway. And so I, uh, I messed up my back. And, and I was hurting. And he, didn't, he wasn't real warm and fuzzy. And he didn't really seem to care. And, uh, and I was having my pastor pray for me and the pains that were shooting through my back. And I remember one morning I woke up and I was as tight as a bowstring. Literally, I was arched in my back. Not a lot, but I was arched in my back. So I'm lying in my bed. And I was laying there in the pain. And I started talking to my friend. And I'd only been living for God less than three months. And I said, Jesus, I know you can heal me. And I heard him speak. I heard it, not out loud, but it's neat when you hear the voice of God. And when you hear it, you know it. It wasn't an impression, it was words. He said three words, be ye healed. And all of a sudden, I melted. Literally, I felt like I was falling back into eider down. I was melting into the bed. I was completely, totally healed. And I just melted. In fact, I went back to sleep and I, bam, 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 bam. My, my sweet boss was beating on the door. But that was wonderful. God is just, he's so faithful. He's so faithful. Not long after I was married, I had, a, had my, my teeth problems, bad problems. It was it bad. I got prayed for. God instantly healed me. And I said, I'm healed. My pastor said, yes, that's why you came up. And, and another time I had my right knee was hurt really bad, bad and it swelled up and my pants were so tight you couldn't hardly pinch them. And, and I got prayed for and it got worse. By the end of service, I was in so much agony. But I asked my pastor to pray for me again and the power of prayer, he healed me instantly. And that all went away. One time, years later, I mean months later, one time, months later, but years and years ago, I was sitting in a restaurant, and I started to get out of the, of the restaurant, and I turned to the side, and I felt that same pain shoot into my knee, and I looked at my knee, and I could already feel the swelling, and I said, devil, you're a liar, God healed me, and instantly it went back down, and it's never bothered me since, praise God. 
Now, how can we make it through this world without prayer? How can we make it through without talking to God? I, I, I know what it, what it is. I, to, I, I, we, I had a job and, and I got a job working for another guy. This guy said, I've got work lined up for years. And he was paying me the unbelievable. I, I had a job making $55 a week. I got paid every two weeks. And this job was going to pay me $100 a week. You have to understand, in the 70s, this was huge money. And so I'm getting $100 a week. And I was so happy. And, and my wife was working for J.C. Penney's. And I said, look, quit the job. The church, I'm just telling you what our story was. It's not your story, it's my story. And, and I said, quit the job. The church needs you. Sister Moss needs you. You quit the job, and you work, and you help. And she said, yes. And so, so she quit that job. And I had this job and making 100 bucks a week, and that was more than I, she was making. I mean, we're doing so good. I'm so happy. And I worked about a month. And the guy calls us in, and he says, I'm out of money. Everybody go home. So, so much for that. Uh, at that moment, that $55 a week job looked pretty good. And, uh, and, and then my pastor's wife was praying. She was praying for me. We were out of work, and, and my wife said, I guess I'm going to have to go back to pennies. And I said, well, yeah, you could except for the fact that we made a promise to God. We promised God. We said, God, if I get this job, we promised God you would quit. I said, it's, if you'd have just quit, that's one thing. But we promised God. So we can't go back. And, uh, and, and, and my pastor's wife called. She said, Brother Booker, I've never had this happen to me before. But I was praying for you, and the Lord spoke to me. She goes, I've never had God speak to me before. But I was praying, God, please help the bookers. Please help the bookers. And he spoke to me and said, I will take care of the bookers. Now, to those of you who have heard that little story before, that don't mean much to you unless your name is Booker. If your name is Booker, that means an awful lot. And I remember a couple of days later, I was sitting in the same chair where I'd answered the phone when Sister Moss called. And the phone rang, and it was the employment agency. And she said, is this Larry? I said, yes. She said, Larry, a job just came down right out of heaven. That was her words. And she named it. I was driving a truck, but I come home every night. I was home on weekends. I said, ma'am, it didn't come out of heaven. It came straight from the throne. And God gave me that job. And I could just tell you the stories, the blessings, and the way God worked. And don't take this any other. I'm just telling you what happened. We were in a small church, and I said, Sister Booker, Brother and Sister Moss need all the help they can get. And I said, we're going to start paying double tithes. We started paying double tithes within a short matter of time. I got a $50 a week raise, then I got another $50 a week raise, then I got another $50 a week raise, then I got another $50 a week raise. And after a while... I was making more money in the church than anybody in the church, including a man that had worked 25 years for Phillips Petroleum. And God just blessed. God just blessed. Then we got into the big money. We went evangelizing. And uh, that's when I had to borrow money to get off the field. <laughs> Literally. I really did. But, but the answers... The things that God did. When we were about to go evangelizing, and I felt it, and our pastor felt it. I said, God, we're leaving. I want two, two families to come and take our place. Two families have got to come and take our place. About a week or two before I left, a family came. They moved in from out of town. And then it was our last service. We were leaving the next day to start evangelizing. And I was praying before service. And, I, and I, I said, God, I don't know where that other family is. I've really been praying that you give two families to take our place. 
and and I was kneeling at the pew, and when I leaned up, I was looking at a man's face, and uh, I said, "Hello." He said, "Hi. How are you?" I said, "Fine. My name's Larry Booker." He told me his name. And, and I said, it's so good to have you visit. He goes, no, I'm not visiting. He said, I just, I'm the new manager of the Goodyear Tire Store. I said, I said, I love the apostolic way. I'm in the truth. I'm in the church. He said, said, this is our first service. We just moved here. I said, now, God, you got good timing. You got, you got good timing. There is an unbelievable power to be found in prayer. In prayer, in prayer. Listen, brothers and sisters, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. I was telling somebody night before last. No, I was telling somebody last night. They'd been in a revival that we were in one time. And, and, and I told them three main things that stood out to me in that revival. One of them was uh, the heat and the fact that our air conditioning kept going out. Another thing was that the piano player and the musician was so fabulous that when I give the altar call, when this person, I finally, after about a week, I said, please don't sing. When I'm giving the altar call, don't sing. Just play. And they said, okay, sure. Why? Their voice was so beautiful that I'd be giving the altar call and everybody's like this. Ah, and, and she would start singing. They go, ah. Her voice was so arresting, it would steal the altar call. And, and, and so I said, just, and that was the second thing. The other thing was, I needed surgery. I was hurting so bad. I was in, I was in very, very bad physical pain. And many night after church, and I, was, I, I had no insurance, and I knew I needed surgery. I would, I would go back, and I would lie down, and I would just have to lie still, because I was in some real, real, real pain. And uh, sometimes I'd, I'd li- literally have to lean on the door, of the uh, trailer and take my breath to make my way up into the trailer. And, and so we had prayer for the sick one night and, and I told God, I said, God, I'm going to be in every single prayer line, every single prayer line that, that I can find, uh, even if I have it, because I'm going to, I'm going to do it until you heal me. And, and so we prayed for all of the sick. And then I went down and I said, pastor, please, you got to pray for me. And when he prayed for me, I was instantly healed instantly brothers and sisters oh what pain oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer I feel Jesus here tonight brothers and sisters I feel like he's, he's lowering the scepter. And he's saying, I'll see. If you just hack your way out a little bit and start talking to me, you're going to be shocked at what I'll do. You're going to be shocked at how I'll come on the scene. We need God in our every single service. We need his presence. We need his grace and we need his glory. There needs to be a man that, and and I do love it. I love it. I don't know how many people have come in to see our building and thank God for that. And when they come in, I don't know how many people have told me, oh, first, this is so beautiful. Thank God for that. But then they say, oh, this feels so good. This feels so nice in here. You know what it is? I'm going to tell you something. When I was evangelizing, I could tell when I go into a church where there was prayer and where there had been no prayer. It's one thing to be in a room, but it's another thing to be in a room that's been saturated with prayer. And people can feel it. Amen. This Inland Empire desperately needs, amen, and this, 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 this arena desperately needs people that will just talk to him. And walk with him and take him by the hand and say, God, come on the scene and help us. Come on the scene and do there is a power to be found in prayer that I'm going to tell you something you can't find anywhere else. 
God wants to answer. God wants to move. God wants to minister. God wants to set free. God wants to break bonds. God wants to break yokes. And I'm here to tell you, if he can find people that will just walk and talk and pray and seek his face and throw in some fasting, amen, and just say, God, we need you in every service. We, we, We need you this coming Wednesday night. We need you on Sunday morning. We need you on Sunday night. When the door, we need you, God. We need, we need you to come in this house. We need you to touch lives and hearts and souls. God can do big things. He can do big things. Amen. Brother Ron, where's Brother Ron? Ron Rojas, you here tonight? I remember the night you got the Holy Ghost. They gave you up for cancer. They sent him home. They said, he's toast, he's gone. And God gave him the Holy Ghost. And when he went back to the doctors, the doctors were blown away because it was gone. Can I tell you something? He wants to keep doing that. He wants to keep doing that. I remember when he did the same thing for Brother Dwayne Davis's dad, dying of cancer, gave him up, got the Holy Ghost the next day, checked him out, all gone. Can I tell you something? We're talking about a big God. We're we're talking about a mighty God. We're talking about a God that says, I'm the same yesterday. I'm the same right now. I'll be the same tomorrow. Heaven will pass away. Earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. Amen. Seek me. You'll find me. Knock. You're going to get your answer. Amen. Amen. The doors are going to be open. I'm faithful. I'm good. I'm great. He's a mighty God. He's a faithful God. He's a wonderful God. He loves this area. I don't understand it, but he's got a special thing going for the Southland. He wants to do a mighty work. He wants to help the Inland Empire. We're not the only one. There's others, but thank God we're somebody that God wants to use. Don't be, and we've got to come to this place. And in a sense, we're there. But I'm going to tell you, we really need to come. Don't be afraid on the job to pray for somebody right there. Right there. Right on the spot. And certainly, don't be afraid to say, come to our church. We'll pray for you. God's big. God's mighty. God's a healer. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And how nice to know that you can bring them to a place where everybody's got a machete and they've hacked out through the vines a place to pray. Amen. And when they come, they can feel something different. They they don't find this where else they've been going. They don't feel this in their home. There's not, oh, oh, oh. But this is different. Hey, 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 how do you get? I'm going to tell you, because there's some men and women, amen, that have fallen in love with Jesus. And Jesus, by the mercies of Almighty God, he fell in love with us. And he wants to do good things and great things and precious things. And there's just something in us that says, God, do what you want to do. I don't know how many people, I was, I was in a business office the other day. The man said, how long have you been here? 15 years next month. Previous residents, Roy Grandy, California. You know, by Pismo Beach. Yeah. How long were you there? Twelve and a half years. Previous occupation? I was pastoring up there too. He put down the pen and said, You were up in by Pismo Beach? I said, Yes, sir. And you came here? Yes, sir. Where'd you live up there? I said, I lived out in the country. What'd you come here for? I said, there's a lot of places I'd rather live than Rialto, but there ain't no place in the world I'd rather pastor. I'm going to tell you something about this area. There's hungry people here. There's people with more problems than a run over dog, but I'm going to tell you something. There's hungry people, and there's a hungry God, and he wants to work. 
He wants to move. He wants to deliver. Oh, oh, but he needs people that'll just talk to him and believe him and trust him and love him and worship him. We're not trying to get blood out of a turnip. We're not trying to twist God's arm. He wants to move. He desires to move. He's looking to move. He's searching to move. His eyes going to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for somebody. Their heart's perfect towards him. He wants to show himself strong in their behalf. Let's stand. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I got, I got lots of stories. I got lots of things we could talk about. But God is so powerful. And you never know when and you never know where. Remember my brother-in-law telling me when he was a boy, he said, I'll never forget it. He said, I was about eight years old. He said, there was a sister in the church. He said, her husband had been bed fast several years, four, five, six years, something in there. And she'd get him all set, ready, everything around him he needed. He was cogent, he was cognizant. And he was glad for her to go to church. And she'd pray as quick as she could, so she'd run back home. And and there was a man came by and was about to preach that night. Never been in that congregation before. This wasn't a bunch of stuff. This wasn't somebody wondering who's got a bad pituitary gland. This was a guy that got up and said, and I don't, remember, I don't know her name. My, my brother-in-law could tell you. It was Sister Jacqueline Withers or whatever it was. Stand up. But he's looking around, she, she stands up. He said, you know, you better go home. God just healed your husband. And he's there very excitedly waiting for you to get home. This is before cell phones, obviously. She screams, she runs out, she jumps in the car. She scr- when she gets home, she runs in the front door. And he's standing there waving his hands, loving God, because God had healed him. I'm just going to tell you how far God can go. In that same church, years later, years later, a revival hit that church. And just one little deal. There was a man, his girlfriend, his live-in girlfriend. She came to that church. He was, he was the biggest cat burglar in that city. Literally, he was the man. And, uh, but he drank and drug and stone. And him and his girlfriend, did the, she did the same. And, uh, but she went to that church and she got baptized and got the Holy Ghost. She moved out on him, made him mad. Well, he uh, he came, he was sitting there in the back. He used to have a friend that was a Baptist. I know you're standing, I'm almost done. And I shouldn't have said he's a Baptist. Anyway, he was a friend that was a Baptist preacher. And he went to church one night. And the Baptist preacher said, come on up and pray. He said, oh man, that's good, I don't want to pray. No, no, you're going to pray. He said, I don't want to pray, man, leave me alone. No, you are going to pray. He said, let me go, dude. I don't want to pray. He, I said, you're going to pray. He said, and I'm telling you, you let me go right now or you're going to be very sorry, man. He said, I said, you're going to pray. And he stood up and he knocked his friend out cold. And the pastor, everybody screamed. And he walked out. So he said, I ever go to church again. Somebody touches me, wants me to pray. I'll cold cock him again. So he's sitting in the back, and he's pretty looped. My brother-in-law was preaching, and he, he prayed. He said, God, straighten that guy out, sobered him up. Anyway, service ended, altar calls being given. And, and this guy's way in the back, 
And he steps out into the aisle. And all of a sudden, he... And he stops and he starts and he just pushes up. And he's, get, and, he's, and he's in a ridge. And he gets up, he's something shoving him all the way. He turns around. He stepped out into the aisle. He was getting out of there. And he felt a hand come on his back and shove him. And he thought, if I knocked out my friend, whoever this is, they're dead meat. And he'd start to turn around and he'd feel that hand shove him again. And third time down here, shoved him all the way to the altar. And he turned around. There ain't nobody shoving him. Brother Howard said, you need help? You all right? He said, yeah, I think I do. Before he left that altar, he was speaking in other tongues. The Spirit of God gave him the evidence. <laughs> Musicians, come. I'm just telling you what God can do. I'm just telling you how far God can go. If you find some people, just hack out a spot and say, Jesus, I'm going to talk to you. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere in God, and it's going to be a beautiful journey because you're an awesome God. I just want to see how big you are. The man that was a backslider became a fishing freak. Won trophies. Picked up his family after Sunday morning church. Church was having dinner on the grounds. He, he picked them up. They were going somewhere else. They were friends and family. There's been a lot of prayer made for this man. This really happened. I knew the man this happened to. He gets in the car, wife and kids, starts up the car. This happened. The kids were there. The wife was there. He was there. And puts his hand on the wheel. Starts driving out of the driveway. He's heading off to the left. And something throws his hands off the steering wheel. This really happened. And the car cranks to the right. And goes down the street. He ain't touching a brake pedal. He's not touching a gas pedal. He's not touching a steering wheel. He's sitting there petrified. His wife is watching. She's in church. He ain't. The car goes to the left. It goes. It drives on its own. With him. Sitting at the wheel. Petrified. The kids leaning over the seat. Mom. White faced. Pulls up. To the church house where they're still having dinner on the grounds and his door opens up. And he gets out. And he runs into the church house, runs down to the basement. Brother, where are you, brother? Hi, you gotta help me. What the help me? They go upstairs. Within five minutes, he's speaking in other tongues with tears rolling down his cheeks. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're talking about a big God. We're talking about a mighty God. We're talking about an awesome God. That can do exceedingly abundantly above all we're able to ask or think. Somebody just says, Count me in. Count me in, Jesus. I want to be an asker. be a seeker I want to be a finder I want to I want to cut me out of spot and I want you to know I love you pull up your prayer list back side of this list 
up here is my top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen items of prayer. And that ain't all I pray about. But that's my top sixteen things. That God, come on, God, you're big. And you're so mighty. And you're so neat. And I feel like he's saying, we're like Simon Peter on the boat. If that's you, out there on the water in the midst of this storm and wind and waves, bid me come. I feel like Jesus is saying, come on. Anybody want to step out of your boat tonight and say, Jesus, I'm going to, we're going to do it. Some way, somehow, we're going to walk, we're going to talk, we're going to pray. I'm going to draw nigh to you, God, so you can draw nigh to me. I want to be your friend so you can be mine and a friend of my family and a friend of this church. A friend of this city and a friend of this inland empire. Come on, sir. Come on now. We're talking about a big God in this house tonight. We're talking about a mighty God. He's here to help you. He's here to help all of us. Come on, let's pray. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Keep praying. Let's talk to God. One thing we're going to pray about, we're starting a revival.